Chapter 22 The Influence of Maternal Chastity Upon the Brain Development of the Embryo The embryo is a condensation of the maternal blood, and for an embryonic superman to be formed, superblood is required. The blood of the mother is enriched and vitalized chiefly by her glandular secretions, particularly by those of the sex glands. There exists a very intimate relationship between the maternal genital secretions, or hormones, and the growing brain of the fetus. On this account, excessive sexual intercourse previous to conception and during gestation, by draining the mother's blood of genital secretions, which are otherwise lymphatically absorbed and used for the construction of embryonic brain tissue, since these secretions are very rich in phosphorus, the principal element required for the formation of nerve cells, results in the birth of a physically and mentally subnormal child. Many ills and great suffering are directly traceable to excessive sexual intercourse during the non-pregnant state, and sexual intercourse during pregnancy is responsible for an almost endless list of physical and mental defects, ranging all the way from color blindness to idiocy, and the number of physical and mental defectives, due to this cause, is rapidly increasing from year to year. It is also responsible for universal unhappiness among married women who know, instinctively, that it is harmful. Maternal chastity, before and after conception, leads to opposite results. Eames, in The Principles of Eugenics, describes an experiment in which the reproductive cells of an individual were microscopically examined after a period of dissipation, and, again, after one of continence. In the latter case, they were larger and more vital than in the former. The author remarks that children born from devitalized reproductive cells would be physically and mentally inferior than those born from the others. Therefore, the supermen of the past were born either from young virgins or from mothers of advanced age who were considered barren. In both cases, they were women who were not menstruating. There is an important reason for this, for menstruation involves a periodic loss of seminal fluid thereby draining the blood of elements required for a superior embryonic brain. For a superman to be born, it is therefore necessary that his mother be a non-menstruating virgin. The longer the genital fluid of the mother is preserved within her body previous to conception, the superior, physically, mentally, and spiritually, will be the coming child. All great men had pious and chaste mothers, though their fathers were not always so, as were those of Zoroaster, Krishna, Samuel, Buddha, Plato, Confucius, Mary, John the Baptist, Jesus, St. Augustine, St. Bernard, St. Francis, Thomas Aquinas, St. Teresa, George Fox, Wesley, Rembrandt, Beethoven, Priestley, Locke, Kant, Pestalozzi, Abraham Lincoln, Mary Baker Eddy, and Annie Besant. In an ancient writing, it is stated that the unborn Buddha reflected on her who should be his mother, according to the customs of Buddhas, he could not be born of any ill-conducted, immoral person, but of one who had passed stainlessly, through countless generations, and had never offended against the five great commandments, abstinence from, 1, the eating of animal foods, 2, stealing, 3, sexual indulgence, 4, untruthfulness, 5, the drinking of alcoholics. There are important physiological reasons why continence during the period preceding conception involving not only abstinence from sexual activity, but also the complete conservation of genital fluid, is necessary if a superior child is to be produced. The human egg at the commencement of its development is much like a hen's egg, containing white germinal substance and a yolk in the center. The chemical composition of this yolk, the first external material to enter into the embryonic brain, is determined by the blood supply to the ovaries during the period previous to conception. Any loss of genital fluid during that time impoverishes and devitalizes the blood, and deprives the yolk of the maturing ovum of the phosphorus compounds required for the nourishment of the embryo's brain tissues, at the commencement of its development. Before Alexander the Great's conception, his mother lived alone in a temple. Mary's parents, previous to her conception, lived for about twenty years, chastely. St. Patrick was born from parents who lived in chastity, both before and after his conception. His father was a priest, and it was then the rule that clergymen were permitted to marry if they lived chastely with their wives. St. David was born of a nun who neither before nor after, his conception, knew a man, but, continuing in chastity of mind and body, led a most faithful life. Isaac Newton's father died before his birth, his mother not marrying until three years later.
not only were conditions after his conception comparatively chaste, but also those before. It is stated upon good authority that Sir Isaac Newton was conceived after two years of enforced continence. The exemplary life, spotless chastity, and towering genius of the eminent philosopher testify to his splendid inheritance. Many are indebted to a life cause for their superior qualities. Nietzsche was his mother's first child, born four years after marriage. Since his father was a minister, we may assume comparatively chaste conditions prior to his birth. Continence during gestation, which is universally practiced by healthy animals, unperverted primitive people and Indians, is a law of nature. After its fertilization, the egg attaches itself to the uterine mucous membranes, which then thicken and swell, so that their glands may produce increased secretions for the nourishment of the embryo. These glandular secretions fill the cavity of the uterus, in which the embryo is developing, its cervical opening, the OS uteri, being plugged by sticky mucus, so that all of this valuable fluid may be retained. The first differentiation to appear on the embryo is the neural canal, the beginning of the spine, brain, and nervous system. The young embryo is almost all brain tissue. At the end of the first month of its development, when it is half an inch in length, its head is larger than the rest of the body. The younger the brain, the more plastic and sensitive it is, and the more durable are impressions made upon it. During its early formation, the size and chemical quality of the embryonic brain are largely determined by the character of its nutrition, by certain organic minerals, such as phosphorus, which are obtained from the secretions of the genital glands. The embryo is nourished first by the yolk sac attached to it, then by the glandular secretions in the uterus, and finally by the maternal blood, conveyed to it through the placenta and the umbilical cord. The uterine secretions are then absorbed by lymphatics and transmitted to the embryo through the blood. The quality of these secretions is determined by the mother's diet and by the degree to which they are conserved within the body through chastity. Intercourse during pregnancy, by causing coincident and subsequent discharges, by orgasms and by leucorrhea, of these secretions, the raw material of embryonic brain tissue, interferes with and retards the normal development of the unborn child. This violation of natural law, any sex relationships from conception until childbirth, leads to the following serious consequences. 1. Miscarriage or stillbirth. 2. The various sicknesses of pregnancy, such as morning sickness and nausea, continence, combined with proper diet, makes pregnancy a period of increased health, without the disorders which usually accompany it. 3. Nervous disturbances, such as neurasthenia and hysteria. 4. Hemorrhages during parturition, puerperal fever, and death of mother or child during or after childbirth. 5. By causing the escape from the uterus of glandular secretions which are normally absorbed and used for the nourishment and invigoration of the brain and nervous system of mother and child, it not only causes neurasthenic and hysterical symptoms in her, but leads to the birth of nervous and idiotic children. 6. It results in a mechanical and chemical irritation of the female genital tract, introducing into it extraneous matter, which settles on the surface of the embryo, appearing as the vernix caseosa, the foul-smelling, cheesy substance which covers the newborn child. This substance decomposes, generating poisonous toxins, which interfere with normal embryonic development, causing feeble-mindedness, color blindness, blindness, and skin disease. The effect of the male seminal fluid upon the embryo is particularly injurious when it is poisoned by the use of tobacco or alcohol. By lymphatic absorption, the organism of the mother is also injured. Dr. P. T. Johnson, an Indian physician, said, Our people have always known, and the old mothers of the tribe teach, that sexual connection after pregnancy is the cause of the condition known to the medical profession as vernix caseosa, and they forbid intercourse during that time. Among primitive peoples, such a substance as Vernix caseosa is unknown. Skin diseases are unknown among primitive peoples, nor are they afflicted with sore or weak eyes. Dr. E. B. Marshall says, The Dunkards refrain from sex relations during pregnancy, and I do not remember a single case where there was an appreciable amount of Vernix caseosa on an infant born of a Dunkard during my long practice of 25 years among these people. Dr. Hubbard states, I have kept a record of more than a hundred cases and have found that in every case, where there had been no sex congress after pregnancy had set in, that the babe was born free from that unctuous substance, vernix caseosa, 
but where sex relation existed, the child was covered with more or less of this poisonous substance. Dr. Hilscher says, Reliable statistics are given in which it is stated that one-third of the blind in Europe become so from the poison of vernix, and that alone. It also implants morbid erotic impulses in the child, such as the tendency to masturbate. This is due to prenatal influence, but more particularly to the effect of the lymphatically absorbed male seminal fluid. 7. It causes difficult and painful childbirth. Intercourse during pregnancy frequently causes an interruption of the gestation, miscarriage, and occasionally puerperal sepsis, blood poisoning. It also causes a terrific excitation on the part of the mother, which is transmitted to and injures the unborn child, causing it to be less near to perfection in physique and mentality than was intended by nature, and than it would have been had the mother been left alone by the male during pregnancy to develop the child properly. It also implants morbid erotic impulses in the child, such as the tendency to masturbate. This is due to prenatal influence, but more particularly to the effect of the lymphatically absorbed male seminal fluid. If a virile bull breaks into a pen with a pregnant cow, the latter will make every effort within her power to avoid him. If she be unable to do so, the stock raiser always expects to be presented later on with a defective calf. This calf may have three or five legs or two tails, or two heads, or an abnormal number of internal organs, or it may have minor defects not readily noticeable, and this principle applies to the breeding of all other animals, including human beings. When an accident of this kind occurs, the stock raiser does not attempt to attribute it to any other than its true cause, i.e., sexual intercourse during pregnancy, and his natural procedure is to make better provision for the future to keep bulls away from his pregnant cows. Human beings, in the belief that they are immune from the consequences of violating the natural laws which govern the relationship of the sexes among animals, use present marriage laws as an excuse for forcing a woman, in pregnancy and out, to occupy the same bed or habitation with a man who is, in fact, only a bull in human form, in so far as sex matters are concerned. The belief that a man cannot go for long periods without sexual intercourse is everywhere current. This is only true if he be subjected nightly to the terrific sex appeal of a semi-nude bed companion. As this condition universally prevails, it results in the universal indulgence of an unbridled sexual passion. Among the lower animals, the female selects the male most pleasing to her, unhampered in her choice by any latent desire for food, clothing, or protection. She then permits the male so selected to have sexual intercourse with her, until she is pregnant, then, in certain species, she either drives him away, or leaves him. In others, she permits him to remain nearby to help provide for the young, but she does not, in the natural state outside of captivity, allow the male to have sexual intercourse with her again, until a certain time after the birth of the offspring. Compare this eminently sensible conduct of the lower animals with present customs and teachings of human beings throughout the greater portion of the world that lead young girls to believe that sexual intercourse is improper until marriage and imply that any amount of it after marriage is natural, legal, and proper. Such customs and teachings are almost wholly responsible for the millions of disillusioned, diseased, unhappy, embittered married and ex-married men and women now living, and also for hordes of unwanted, defective, unhappy children, who fill the slums of every city, and who are to be found in lesser numbers in every community throughout the world. The majority of physicians now practicing have been taught that sexual intercourse during pregnancy is allowable up to the eighth month, and many of these physicians have been passing this information on to their women patients for years. Many of these physicians now realize that the practice is harmful and that they may have been indirectly responsible for scores of miscarriages, with their frequently resultant injurious complications, and for many defective children. Frequently, however, an obstetrician will be found who will state in unqualified terms that sexual intercourse during pregnancy is horrible, that it is positively injurious to both mother and child, and that it places human beings on a moral plane below that of the lower animals. When all women learn the potential value of their possession, and also learn the vital necessity of its conservation after marriage as well as before, then the species will become magnificent in strength of body and brilliance of mind, radiant health will make it immune to disease life will be indefinitely prolonged. Revolutionary achievements by both men and women will follow each other in rapid succession. The author of the preceding asked a number of physicians the question, 
Is sexual intercourse during pregnancy capable of causing a interruption of gestation, miscarriage, b puerperal sepsis, blood poisoning? The answer to this question was yes, invariably. Many great men, including Krishna, Jesus, Saint David, and Leonardo da Vinci, were born of mothers who did not live together, as wife and husband, with their fathers. Krishna's mother, during gestation, lived alone in the forest, subsisting entirely on wild fruit and berries. Mary, during her pregnancy, lived together with Elizabeth, away from her husband and from the father of her child. Saint David's mother was a wandering nun, whose child was conceived by a king of a distant land. Leonardo da Vinci's mother, a peasant girl, lived apart from his father, who was of noble descent and who married another woman soon after his conception. Plato and Buddha, like Jesus, were children of chaste gestation. Plato's biographer, Olympiodorus writes, an Apolloniacal specter is said to have had connection with Perixion his mother, and appearing in the night to his father, Aristo, it commanded him not to sleep with, Perixion, during the time of her pregnancy, which mandate Aristo obeyed. After Buddha's conception, his mother lived alone, away from her husband, in a special garden which was provided for her, eating only fruits and the products which nature provided. From that time no sensual desire ever disturbed her thoughts. She steadfastly obeyed, as she had done from her youth up, the five great commandments, and abstained from all impurity, as the mothers of Buddhas ever have done. The mother of Alexander the Great, during pregnancy, lived apart from her husband, Philip of Macedon. Since Isaac Newton's father died before his birth, and since chaste conditions prevailed for two years previous to his conception, we may assume comparative chastity during his gestation. Schopenhauer's superior intellect like that of Plato's, was due, to a large degree, to his chaste gestation, during which time his mother lived in a country villa, apart from her husband, who was engaged in business in a distant city.